Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Cambridge Union's third debate of Michaelmas term. We're delighted to welcome a range of distinguished academics and philosophers this evening to debate and discuss the motion, This House Believes God is Not a Delusion. The format is slightly different tonight and hopefully should allow a little bit more audience interaction. We're going to have four speeches, two on either side, all of 15 minutes in length, and halfway through the debate we're going to open up for points on the floor. It's a really big, busy house tonight, and there's quite a few people in overflow rooms, so when we do break to questions from the floor, we're going to ask if you can use a microphone handed to you by the stewards so people in all the other rooms can hear. Uh, now, to open the case for the proposition that this house believes God is not a delusion, we're delighted, I'm delighted to introduce Peter Williams, who is a philosopher who works for the Christian charity, the Damaris Trust, and author of A Skeptic's Guide to Atheism. Peter, thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to be here. According to the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, as you'll see from your uh, handout, a delusion is defined as a false belief based on incorrect inference about external reality that is firmly sustained despite what almost everyone else believes and despite what constitutes incontrovertible and obvious proof or evidence to the contrary. The belief is not one ordinarily accepted by other members of the person's culture or subculture. For example, it's not an article of religious faith. Unfortunately for our opponents this evening, theism is an article of religious faith that is ordinarily accepted by people in our culture but which isn't necessarily inferred from external reality. Hence, it is, by definition, not a delusion. While we forego this purely definitional victory, <laughs> it does seem fair to note that since the opposition claim that theism isn't merely intellectually mistaken, but delusory, they thereby shoulder the burden of offering incontrovertible and obvious proof for the non-existence of God. Since we don't know of any incontrovertible disproof of God, rather than attack straw men at this point, we'll simply argue for theism. For if theism is true, it can't be a delusion. So permit me to sketch the three arguments for God whose propositions are listed on your handout, beginning with a moral argument. One, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Two, at least one objective moral value exists. Three, therefore, God exists. It's important not to confuse this argument with the false claim that we must believe in God in order to know or to do the right thing. Now what does it mean to claim that a moral value is objective? Well, suppose one person thinks that the sun goes around the earth, whilst another thinks the opposite. In this case, we know that the earth goes around the sun. Those who believe otherwise, however sincerely, are wrong. Moreover, coming to know that the earth goes around the sun is a matter of discovering truth, not inventing it. Moral objectivism says that ethics is about discovering moral truths, truths that exist even if we fail to discern them. And according to moral objectivism, there are genuine moral disagreements. And the observation that people sometimes have different moral opinions just goes to show that our moral beliefs can be either correct or incorrect according to the moral facts of the matter. So, are there any objective moral facts? Well, those who point to the reality of evil in the world as a basis for arguing against the existence of God certainly think so. For nothing can be objectively evil if there are no objective values. John Cottingham reports that the increasing consensus among philosophers today is that some kind of objectivism of value is correct, close quote. 
For example, the atheist Peter Cave, who chairs the Humanist Philosophers Group for the British Humanist Association, defends objective moral values by appealing to his intuitions. And I quote, Whatever sceptical arguments may be brought against our belief that killing the innocent is morally wrong, we are more certain that the killing is morally wrong than that the argument is sound. Torturing an innocent child for the sheer fun of it is morally wrong. Close quote. The properly basic moral intuition that torturing innocent children for fun is wrong isn't undermined by the existence of the psychopath who enjoys torturing children. By the principle of credulity, torturing an innocent child for fun clearly isn't merely something that stops a child functioning normally, an empirical observation, or merely something we dislike because of our evolutionary history, or merely something that our society has decided to discourage. Rather, torturing an innocent child for fun is objectively wrong. So at least one thing is objectively wrong, therefore moral subjectivism is false. Now, some moral intuitions are very specific. For example, it's evil to use children to clear minefields, as was done in the Iran-Iraq war. And some intuitions are general. For example, it's always right to choose the lesser of two evils. Now, of course, of course, our moral intuitions could be mistaken. But this very admission of fallibility presupposes moral objectivism. For if moral subjectivism were true, no moral claims could be mistaken. As the atheist philosopher Russ Schaefer Landau writes, subjectivism's picture of ethics as a wholly conventional enterprise entails a kind of moral infallibility for individuals or societies. This sort of infallibility is hard to swallow. Close quote. Finally, if moral objectivism were false, it couldn't be true that we objectively ought to consider arguments against objectivism, or that we ought to consider them fairly. Knowing this, we see the impossibility of justifying subjectivism, for to embrace an argument for subjectivism would be to take the self contrary position that A, there are no objective moral values, but that B, we objectively ought to accept subjectivism. Therefore, the second premise of the moral argument seems to me to be secure. Turning to the first premise, many atheists acknowledge that if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. For example, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote that he was, quote, extremely embarrassing that God does not exist, for there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. There can no longer be any good a priori, since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. Close quote. An objective moral value is a transcendent ideal that prescribes, that obligates our behavior. But an ideal implies a mind. A prescription requires a prescriber, and an obligation is contingent upon a person. As H.P. Owen argues, quote, on the one hand, objective moral claims transcend every human person. On the other hand, it's contradictory to assert that impersonal claims are entitled to the allegiance of our wills. The only solution to this paradox is to suppose that the order of objective moral claims is in fact rooted in the personality of God. Secondly, a cosmological argument. The Leibnizian type of cosmological argument builds upon the so-called principle of sufficient reason. One, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. Secondly, the universe exists. Third, therefore, the universe has an explanation of its existence. Four, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Five, therefore, the explanation of the universe's existence is God. Now, since the universe's existence is rather obvious, 
Non-theists must surely deny premises one or four in this argument to rationally avoid believing in God. Well, many philosophers think that premise one, the principle of sufficient reason, is self-evident. Let me illustrate. Imagine finding a translucent ball on the forest floor whilst out hiking one day. You initially wonder how it came to be there. If a fellow hiker said, it just exists, inexplicably, don't worry about it. You wouldn't take him seriously. Well, suppose we increase the size of this ball you've discovered so that it's as big as the planet. That doesn't remove the need to explain it. Suppose it were the size of the entire universe. Well, how does that remove the need for explanation? Same problem, surely. Turning to premise four, that is, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God, surely this is synonymous with the standard atheistic claim that if God doesn't exist, then the universe has no explanation of its existence. The only other alternative to theism is to claim that the universe has an explanation in the necessity of its own nature. But this is a very radical step, and we can't actually think of any contemporary atheist who takes it. After all, it's coherent to imagine, say, a universe made from a wholly different collection of quarks than the collection that actually exists. But such a universe would be a different universe. So universes clearly don't exist necessarily. Suppose I ask you to loan me a certain book, but you say, I don't have a copy right now, but I'll ask my friend to lend me his copy, and then I'll lend it to you. Suppose your friend says the same thing to you, and so on, and so on. Surely two things are clear. First, if this process of asking to borrow the book goes on ad infinitum, I'll never get the book. Second, if I got the book, the process that led to me getting it can't have gone on ad infinitum. Somewhere down the line of requests to borrow the book, someone had the book without having to borrow it. Likewise, argues philosopher Richard Pertill, consider any contingent reality. He says, the same two principles apply. If the process of everything getting its existence from something else went on to infinity, then the thing in question would never have existence. And if the thing has existence, then the process can't have gone on to infinity. There was something that had existence without having to receive it from something else." End quote. Now, a necessary being explaining all physical reality can't itself be a physical reality. The only remaining possibilities are an abstract object or an immaterial mind. But abstract objects, such as some mathematicians would say of the number seven, for example, are causally impotent. Therefore, the explanation of the universe's existence uh, is a necessarily existent, transcendent mind. And finally, an ontological argument. As the greatest possible being, God is, by definition, a necessary being. And a necessary being is, by definition, a being that must exist if its existence is possible. Hence we argue, one, if it is possible that God exists, God exists. Two, it is possible that God exists, so thirdly, therefore God exists. Now, a great making property is a property that A, endows its bearer with some measure of objective value, and which B, admits of a logical maximum. A sock isn't more valuable than you because it is smellier than you. And however smelly a sock you imagine, it is always possible to imagine a smellier one. Smelliness is not a great-making property. On the other hand, power 
is a great making property, one that has a logical maximum in the concept of being omnipotent. Likewise, necessary being is the maximum instantiation of a great making property. So even if, say, Immanuel Kant were right to argue that saying something exists doesn't add to our knowledge of its properties, to say that something exists necessarily certainly does add to our knowledge of its properties. Hence, most philosophers agree that if God's existence is even possible, then as a necessary being, he must exist. Unlike the tooth fairy, God couldn't just happen not to exist despite his existence being possible. Moreover, think about the fact that humans surely exhibit non-maximal degrees of make great making properties, such as power and knowledge and goodness. And I think this supports the hypothesis that maximal degrees of great making properties can coexist over the hypothesis that they can't. Finally, of course, the moral and cosmological arguments that we just looked at by confirming various aspects of the theistic hypothesis, provide us with independent grounds for thinking that the crucial second premise of this ontological argument is more plausible than its denial. In conclusion, to show that belief in God is a delusion, the opposition must both rebut our cumulative case for theism and offer incontrovertible and obvious proof of God's non-existence. Until and unless they accomplish that task, I recommend the motion to the House. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, just a reminder to everyone that points of information are encouraged as long as you leave the speaker their first and last minute. Um, to do that, just raise your hand and say point of information. Obviously, speakers can make points as well. Uh, it's entirely up to the individual speaker, though, whether or not they accept them. We do normally encourage a couple. Uh, now to open the case for the opposition that this House believes God is not a delusion, we're delighted to welcome Andrew Copson, who is Chief Executive of the British Humanist Association. Andrew, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to start by congratulating the proposition. It's a very good idea, a very good tactic to, to start uh, a debate, to try and win it by defining the terms so they're impossible to argue against. It's an even better tactic to then generously forego it and appear magnanimous at the same time, a double whammy uh, that it's difficult to top. On our side of your chamber, we have uh, a copy of the Oxford uh, Shorter English Dictionary, I'm sorry the Cambridge one was unavailable, from 19 1993, and our uh, dictionary defines delusion as a false impression or opinion and with respect to the uh, assembled medical knowledge of the sources cited by the proposition we're going to go with that if it's alright by you. Obviously it's up to you whether or not our definition um, or the more involved and impossible to argue against definition advanced by the proposition is the one that you should be making your decision on the basis of this evening. God fall down upon our dry fields this is one of the earliest prayers that we have in Europe. It's a Greek prayer, a Greek prayer originally. So that the word for God is Zdeu, the, uh, the Greek word that later went on uh, to mean Zeus. God fall down upon our fields. What's interesting uh, about this is that it doesn't ask God to send rain down upon our fields. It calls on God to fall down as rain. God is being used here in one of the earliest instances of prayer, uh, in this continent at least, to literally mean rain, to literally mean this natural force. And that's interesting because it illustrates for us an important truth about gods, especially gods from long ago, uh, from the first time that we have them uh, mentioned uh, or recorded uh, in human words. Now we know, of course, that rain is not a supernatural entity capable of being prayed to and enjoined to come down and make our crops grow. But we can see how it may once have seemed plausible to think it so.
In the human world in which we all live, by necessity, obviously, we're all human, effects often have deliberate causes. Actions often have deliberate intentions behind them, because we're doing things for a reason. And the association between the two is locked into our minds. So it makes sense, of course, that people would try to find the same rhyme and reason in the non-human world. We try to personalise it. Why does the sun rise? Because the heavenly dung beetle rolls it up uh, into the sky. Why does the rainbow stretch across uh, the sky? Because it's the train of the dress of the, of the heavenly goddess Iris, or a promise put there uh, by uh, a divine being. How did the earth come to be everything we see? Someone must have made it, like a man makes a vase or a hut or a fire. Why do we have feelings in us of goodwill, goodwill to others or feel moral obligations to them? Well, of course, because someone must have put those things into us in the same way that we fill up uh, a glass of water or invent a character in a poem or an epic ballad or a play or a drama. So God's arise, it's pretty fair to say, from all observable uh, evidence that we have in, in, in most contexts, God's arise as explanations for why things are as they are, how things around us happen. But of course, as we begin to understand more about the world, or about ourselves and our own psychology even, we answer these questions in better ways. And as we investigate on this side uh, of your chamber this evening, our claim that gods are artefacts of the human mind that exist only in our thoughts, rather than beings that exist in objective reality around us. This point that I've started with is important. So that's my first point. We do have reasonable evidence that gods originate as ideas to explain what we cannot understand and not because people look around them and draw a reasonable conclusion that God exists. In fact, the conclusions that people have drawn about God over time have a pretty constant track record of turning out not to be true. The more knowledge we acquire, the more we jettison them for better explanations. Of course. Also true of scientific theories. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And by this measure, of course, um, I am treating God as a, similarly, as a similar hypothesis. So a theory advanced in the same way as a scientific theory. A second reason why we should consider gods to be delusions is that there is nothing particularly surprising about them. We might expect to be surprised if we were to look around the universe and discover God. We might expect that it would be a bit of an unusual thing, quite different from the other sort of things that we were used to in very many ways. But in fact, gods tend to be suspiciously like us. And that, I would suggest to you, um, is pretty persuasive um, for the case of us having created them. Two and a half thousand years ago, the philosopher Zenophanes said, if cattle and horses and lions had hands and could paint and sculpt just as people can, horses would depict their gods as horses and cattle would depict their gods as cattle and lions depict their gods as lions. Again, this points towards God's being a human creation, a delusion, if you will, a false belief, certainly, rather than a fair description of reality. They look like us, not just that they're human in form, they behave like us in very many different ways. They have human emotions. The God of the Old Testament is angry and jealous and genocidal. Zeus is lusty. Dionysus is drunk. The God of the New Testament is still jealous, but also... <laughs> Loving, and in human form, of course, compassionate. The gods of desert countries are austere and severe, and the gods of farming communities are fertile and green and fecund. Even today, gods change and reflect us very often. I've never met a conservative who believes in a liberal god, or a liberal who believes <laughs> in a conservative god. Uh, Our gods reflect our prejudices and our environments. And on a larger scale, of course, most people who believe in a god believe in the one their parents believed in. Human stories, again, passed on by human beings, corroborating our case that gods are a delusion rather than reality. We make them in our own image. And we find 
in the history of gods, what we would expect to find if they were delusions. Changing as the humans that create them change, of course. Um, if we were to say that Jesus is God, um, would you not agree that he was quite radically unconventional before his time? Well, I'm not going to speak particularly about Jesus, I'm going to speak about the existence of God, um, but he, the figure of Jesus is of course unconventional in some ways, conventional in others. I think he's entirely explicable by his immediate social context though, even if he's just reacting to that social context. Well, I'll make a little progress first. Gods do not exist in a vacuum different, uh, distinct from each other. We can trace the influences of one myth on another. There are stories of different gods who are killed and rise from the dead, and they influence each other. Judaism and Christianity influence uh, Islam. The idea of beings that sacrifice themselves and come back for the benefit um, of human beings are common. We have Mithras, we have Jesus, we have Odin, we have Prometheus. Child gods whose birth is heralded by miracles and signs and wonders, and even three magicians, um, are there, are, there is more than uh, one god that fits these patterns. Gods are ever-changing, even individual gods change, of course, over time. Now, a refutation of our case um, that God is a delusion is, of course, possible in theory. If it can be demonstrated that there is evidence um, and good reason to believe that a god or gods exist, we uh, should not uh, have your support this evening. Usefully, um, we've been presented with a, a nice handout. Not a, a usual um, uh, device within in a union debate, but helpful to us, uh, as well as to you. We have those arguments there, therefore, uh, in black and white, and we can test a few of them and see whether they do hold up. I'm going to address the moral argument. How long? For a start. And I devoutly hope that I won't have time to have to deal with the ontological one. <laughs> The problem I have here with the moral argument is this idea, this claim, that objective moral values exist. Let's clear away some of the rubble in this discussion. Now, of course, morality is not subjective in the sense that it is something that every individual human being makes up arbitrarily for their individual self, something that is grounded solely in the views and preferences of the individual human being. It's clearly not something that is subjective in that way. But that doesn't mean that it therefore has to come from some source outside of human beings collectively. <coughs> Morality is rooted in the human condition. It's grounded in what it is to be human. The fact that we are social beings, the fact that we have certain objective and entirely shared, therefore, basic needs, which are part of our nature, obviously colours and sets the context in which morality and discussions of morality have to occur. And we need to distinguish the idea that morality is objective in the sense of being independent of the views and feelings <coughs> of particular individuals from the idea that morality has to emanate from and be backed by some sort of authority outside. If it were to be the case, if it were to be the case that morality had to emanate from and be backed by some authority outside of human beings, that would actually, of course, make morality not objective, but subjective depending on what that particular authority happened to want. And many attempts to ground morality in the claimed objective authority of a divine being are changeable in fact, are changeable in practice. One minute gods say, don't kill. And the next they say, kill everyone who lives in this particular town. And one of the speakers on the proposition this evening has gained notoriety in the last couple of days uh, since arriving in Britain for justifying, for example, uh, the genocide against the Canaanites um, in the Bible by saying, God knew that if these Canaanite children were allowed to live, they would spell the undoing of Israel. <laughs> 
Moreover, if we believe, as I do, that God's grace is extended to those who die in infancy or as small children, the death of these children was actually their salvation. We are so wedded to an earthly naturalistic perspective that we forget that those who die are happy to quit this earth for heaven's incomparable joy. Therefore, God does these children no wrong in taking their lives. <laughs> well, it seems um, that uh, this transcendent ultimate source of moral values is at the very best fickle. <laughs> if and at the very worst, appears to prescribe actions and endorse actions that are moral intuitions, which the proposition places so much trust on as guiding us towards the uh, view that they advocate, um, our moral intuitions can be seriously out of step with what this objective source of objective values apparently wants. If your authority, your objective uh, authority, wants something different from what they wanted before, then right becomes wrong. And of course, what we decide is right or wrong depends on our interpretation of this or that sacred text or this or that emanation of authority rather than on the nature of the actions themselves, which I think is what many of us would prefer to see as being moral or immoral, the nature of, of the actions that we're carrying out and the consequences that they have. So since that is the case, an argument from authority is really no more objective than any other sort of uh, argument for moral values and we're better to look at morality uh, with an open mind and impartially this phenomenon of morality that we perceive around us and when we do we find i submit that morality is something that arises naturally amongst human beings when they live together in communities it has its basis in our empathy <coughs> and in our needs as social beings augmented by our conscious efforts and built on by millennia of human culture. We can see echoes of its biological origins in our relatives, chimpanzees, which exhibit the sort of behaviours that we, with our conscious minds, have built on and called morality. We generate these values from within humanity collectively ourselves. The moral journey of individual human beings is a long, hard slog. It's incredibly difficult, it can be incredibly difficult to know what the right thing to do is and it's even more difficult to then do it. And the moral journey of humanity as a whole has been equally difficult to get from a feeling of kinship and affinity with your neighbours to the wider concept of global justice, which today we can aspire to, has been hard. The proposition, through its argument, trivialises morality. The idea that moral values are just something that we can read off a la carte or from some cosmic knitting pattern for how things are, is demeaning to how our moral reasoning really does need to operate in practice. I had hoped to deal, in part at least, with the cosmological argument, but the time is against me, and my colleague will deal with both that, and yes, I've landed him with finding some response to the ontological argument, <laughs> or the so-called argument, um, that was the last argument that was made. But for the moment, I'll simply leave you with the message that God is not in his heaven. Apollo and Aphrodite don't frolic on Olympus. There's no Thor in Asgard. In fact, there's no Asgard. There's no Jupiter, Ishu, Brahma, Anansi. We find gods today in the only place they have ever existed, the human imagination. Certainly false beliefs, the origins of which we can explain by an examination of human history and culture and none of the arguments conventionally made for their objective existence are enough to persuade you otherwise this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, now it's time for you, the audience, to get involved in the debate. We have a few stewards around the floor with microphones, if you want to wave them so people can see, um, so that everyone in the overflow rooms has a chance to hear the debate and the questions. It would be great if you could wait to make your point uh, with the microphone. Um, we're going to take um, a few rounds of points 
or questions, if you want, uh, in favour of the motion, against the motion, and then a few in abstention, if there are any agnostics here. Um, can we first have a point or a question in favour, that is, supporting the proposition this evening? Uh, yes, you saw that. All the other. Uh, the question before the house is whether God is a delusion. And we've heard definition of what delusion is. But unfortunately, none of the parties have actually defined what God is. What is it? Who is it? I mean, everyone has his own version of what God is. And unless we could define what God is, we would not be able to give justice to the proposition and therefore to conclude that God is a delusion. Secondly, I wanted to light upon a very important issue, which is there are three realities about life and about knowledge. And what I know that nobody could actually define what God is. I mean, according to the Oxford Dictionary, God is the maker, is the creator. But I question this functional definition, if God is creator and a maker, then what happens if he doesn't make, but destroys? Therefore, it is a mere functional definition, and there is no concrete definition of what God is. Therefore, what philosophers taught us to do in this case, they taught us to assume what happens if God does not exist. And by so doing, we may conclude that it is absolutely impossible to have a world without God. Therefore, there are three things. So can you draw your, your point to a conclusion so yes. people have a chance to make their points? Yes. Yes. The conclusion is God is a fact that we all know but we don't understand it. Therefore, we may actually try and work hard to be able to understand what God is and therefore to draw a conclusion whether God is a delusion or not. Yes, thanks very much for that. Um, I agree entirely with the first point. The proposition has completely failed to give any good definition of God. There was one incomprehensible philosophical definition to do with socks in the third argument, but there weren't any other definitions. So we've got no idea what, what, you know, what they're even saying is not a delusion. The other two points didn't seem to me to give any reasons for believing in God, so I don't think they support the motion. Um, can we then have a point in opposition of the motion? So you, um, yes, can we have one of the people at the back there? And can you also give your name and college before your speech as well? Um, Hugo Schmidt from Downing College. Uh, since the opposition has seemed to be having trouble with the ontological proof, I just thought I'd handle that one quickly. <laughs> if you take uh, look at the form of that one, you might as well say that the most stupid being you could possibly imagine could not be more stupid than that stupid being if it actually existed. And therefore, this colossal moron is God. Now, that's very clever, but I don't actually think it gets us anywhere. And you can keep playing these games as long as you like. Now, I hand it back to the capable opposition. I'm not sure if anyone actually wants to take the chance to respond to that. Uh, yes, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, stupidity uh, is not a great-making property. 
<laughs> Do we have a point in abstention of the motion? That is, you're not sure whether God is a delusion or not. Uh, yes. Sorry. Oh, right. Yes, the lady at the back, if you can. Um, I am actually sure whether or not God is a delusion, but in abstention of the motion, um, it seems that we have this issue, again, I agree um, with the man who spoke over there, that we aren't defining um, what God is. And unfortunately, um, particularly with the opposition, they seemed more content to just take ideas out of the air that have existed through history and then um, rebut them, which we've already done in this present day, so it's kind of useless. We actually need to address this sort of philosophical idea of whether or not a God can exist. Um, which would be more useful, I think. Can we then get a point in proposition of the motion? This house, please, God is not a delusion. God is not a delusion. Um, do we have any on this side? Sorry? Um, you made a point in the debate, though. Um, yes, you, sir, there. I'm with you. Hi, I believe you used a, uh, sorry, I'm Christopher from Homerton. I believe you used a phrase, uh, we have made God in our image. I'd, say, I'd like to say that the Bible's rebuttal to that is that God made us in his image. I mean, the fact that we have some attributes similar to our fathers is not a good enough reason to say, well, I don't believe in your dad then. So I'd, <laughs> I'd like to say that your argument has been very much kind of against a deistic God who is kind of separated from us and who we don't really have any relationship to a theistic God who is deeply involved in our lives, well, of course, we're going to have reflect some of his um, characteristics. Well, the reason that you're able to say, for example, make, make the analogy with, you know, um, there you are, you look like your dad, um, you know, and I can therefore, you know, know that your dad exists, is because you're aware of all the principles of biology all around you, everyone does have a father. But I'm afraid the, 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 a belief in God is not so universally shared. And you have to explain everything about what God is and how it actually operates in practice before you expect to be able to convince anyone with an analogy uh, like that, I think. Um, but more than that, I don't just say um, that we, that gods look like us in terms of, you know, beards and, and attributes and so on and so forth. I said every god ever conceived of around the world in one way or another plainly bears the indelible marks of human manufacture on it because there is nothing about them that does not reflect, to some extent or other, a human attribute. And those are different human attributes in different gods. So it's not the case of going, well, your argument that we are, that God is like us could equally be an argument that we are like God. That's not sufficient because not all gods are like us in the same way. And you still have to make the prior uh, argument to convince us, I think, that your particular uh, version of God um, is the one that we should be using when we try to uh, decide that point um, in the second place. Um, Thank you. Can we have another question or point in opposition of the motion? motion? So you believe God is a delusion? Um, you got anyone? I think we'll take, yes, one of the, the gentlemen there. Uh, hi, I'm Alex from Robinson. Um, the proposition seemed to put the burden of proof on the, um, on the atheists. And to that, I would just like to make the teapot or the invisible pink unicorn argument in that if I say there's an invisible pink unicorn, is a burden of proof on me, to, uh, on you to prove that it doesn't exist or on me to prove that it does exist? And similarly, if I say that there's a teapot uh, somewhere out in the solar system that's just beyond the reach of any telescope, is the proof on you to say, prove that it doesn't exist or me to prove that it does exist? The proposition this evening is strangely worded negatively in that you're quite right. It places the burden of proof on the opposition. The opposition has to prove tonight that belief in God is a delusion because all we have to prove as the house is that belief in God is intellectually permissible, that it's rational to believe in God, that you're not deluded if you believe in God. And if we carry that tonight, we've carried the motion. <laughs> 
Moreover, we've also provided three arguments for the existence of God. So we're not appealing to invisible unicorns or, or tea cups. We're giving uh, arguments, philosophical arguments for God's existence. Now these arguments that my colleague Peter Williams gave implicitly define God so that we shouldn't be deceived by this notion that God is not defined by our arguments. On the contrary, the ontological argument says that God is by definition the greatest conceivable being. If you could conceive of anything greater than God, then that would be God. So the very concept of God is that of a greatest conceivable being. And as, yes? I'm sorry, you could say that really for a lot of gods, and I would wonder that why, by choosing Christianity, you have... We're not arguing for Christianity tonight. Peter and I are... But yourself, you have um, chosen Christianity, and in doing so, you've rejected a wide number of other gods who all could, uh, to whom in terms of the ontological argument, the cosmological, etc., or yes. moral arguments could all apply. I would like to know um, why, whether you could prove objectively that, for example, Allah does not exist, whether you could go against your own arguments. Your own We're not trying to disprove Allah's existence. We are arguing for a generic monotheism that is affirmed by Jews, Christians, Muslims, deists, and theists of many sort. What the ontological argument gives you, and our other arguments implicitly, is a metaphysically necessary, beginningless, eternal, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being who is omnipotent and the source of absolute moral value. Now that is a concept of God that is worthy of worship and is very different from the sort of God concepts that Andrew Copson opposed. So Andrew has given a very formidable argument against polytheism tonight. Thank you, Andrew. But it doesn't touch the monotheism that we're defending. Okay, if you want to nip back quickly, because that was quite a long, uh, very brief bit. My argument isn't against um, polytheism just because I mentioned lots of different gods. There are many people who believe in individual ones of that range of gods who equally believe that that god was the only god. My argument is clearly against anyone who believes in a god, a set of gods, a god with different attributes, or anything that corresponds to the divine being that is hypothesized by the arguments on the other side. You know, people, people actually, um, in relation to the, the 12 Olympian gods in the ancient world, sometimes only did just believe in one of them, and it wasn't just because it was their favorite, because they were a prostitute and they liked Aphrodite, or because they were a soldier and they liked Mars, or whatever. Um, sometimes they did believe in just one god that they worshipped, um, as it were, monogamously. And so, you know, my argument's not about polytheism, it's about any uh, individual god as well as about a range of gods. I just used a lot of different gods as examples. Right, um, I think we're now looking for a point in abstention, that is, you aren't sure. Um, yes, we'll take Austin there. Have you ever tried to convince a delusional person that they were delusional? I believe in God. Now, this may seem a little bit like an opposition speech, but first take the fact that I believe in God. I accept that there are logical arguments for God, but I may be delusional. And that is the key. I may be delusional. Because the proposition has mistaken their burden of proof here tonight, and they're looking at a fatal error here. They do not simply need to throw the proposition out there. They need to prove that God is definitively not a delusion. The opposition doesn't need to prove that God is a delusion. All they need to show is that God may be a delusion. Now, as I said, I believe in God, but I accept that I may be delusional. I don't know. And I don't think that this can, debate can convince me that I either am or am not delusional. I don't think you can convince a delusional person one way or the other. So I would support abstaining this motion. Similarly, there's also the proposition termed God is a delusion, is not a delusion. Not gods, not some god. The proposition also is tasked with the double burden of proving that there is only one god and that that one god is not a delusion. So I think there's a major mistake here in the burden of proof and in how extreme it really is. Thank you.
Um, we're going to take another point in proposition of the motion, that is, you believe God is not a delusion. Is there anyone in the gallery who's wanting to make a point in proposition? Uh, yeah, can we get a mic to you, possibly? Or just shout very loudly. I have heard of this person. After going to a pilgrimage to Lord, came back to his country, Liban, and prayed. And a miracle happened. After his prayer, he could walk again. So we can call that a miracle. We can call that randomness. Oh, it doesn't really matter how we call it. But I think also if we look at the complexity of our world, like all the elements that need to come together for life to exist, for intelligence to exist. I'm studying sciences, so every day I discover more how complex it is and how incredible. So yeah, you can call that randomness, but I think actually if you think how many randomness need to happen, it is a lot. So if you doubt about this, I would vote for the proposition. Thank you. Thanks. There's two points there I'd like to mention. The first concerns miracles. It seems that the speaker has con confused precedence with cause. The statement that somebody went to a shrine and then was cured is not the same thing as this person went to a shrine and because of that was cured. On the contrary, we have about as good inductive evidence as we have for anything that going to shrines on the whole doesn't stop you from dying of diseases. On the second point, um, I'm not exactly clear what the argument is supposed to be. I mean, if the claim is that it's difficult to see how certain things arise out of randomness, therefore God exists, the argument's plainly invalid. If it's some sort of tacit appeal to what's known as intelligent design, then I could give you a list, and I appreciate you're a scientist, but I could give you a list as long as my arm of people who are professional scientists, such as the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, who reject ID out of hand. OK, we're going to have one more point in opposition the motion and one in abstention, if there are any. Do you have another point in opposition? Um, one from this side. OK, we'll take um, one from uh, the back there. Yes, you see. Thank you. Um, if God created everything, that is, if God created the space-time continuum, what created God? Uh, you, you'll notice that the, the way the first premise of our cosmological argument is phrased, it is not that everything uh, must have a cause, uh, which may invoke this question you ask of, well, if God caused the universe and everything needs a cause, then what caused him? Rather, it is everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in some external cause. Uh, and the arguments that we've given and, and the definition of God that we're working with as well is that God is, by definition, this necessary being, the uncaused cause of all other reality. So to ask what caused that being, which is by definition uncaused, is to ask a, a malformed uh, propositional uh, statement, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, no, we can you get back to the main debate soon. Um, can we, though, have one final point in abstention of the motion? Is there, is there on the gallery? Uh, yes, on the gallery, if you can wait one second. I'm arguing in favour of abstention of the motion because I do not believe this is an issue which it is the House's place to vote on. Um, we're not arguing about how we should act on issues of faith. We're arguing on whether faith itself is valid. Um, while I think this is a perfectly legitimate topic for discussion, I think asserting either way would simply alienate people and has no that there's no benefit to doing so. If we were arguing wh about whether intelligent design should be taught in schools as science, I would say no. The same with if we were arguing as whether or not atheism should be taught as scientifically true. No, science and religion is a, an issue on which we have to make decisions because we have to act on it. This 
Motion isn't necessary, and it's very close to people's hearts what they believe. So to vote either way, I think, would just be a bad idea. So please abstain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to make points from the floor, there, we are obviously allowing points of information for the final two speeches. Um, now to conclude for the proposition this evening, I'm delighted to uh, introduce William Lane Craig. Dr Craig is one of the US's foremost religious apologists and is here in the UK this week as part of his Reasonable Faith Tour. Dr Craig, thank you very much. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege uh, to summarize the House's case in favor of the proposition this evening. Now, as already noted earlier, the proposition is oddly worded in a negative way. Belief in God is not a delusion. In order to carry that proposition, all we need to show is that belief in God is intellectually permissible, that it's rational to believe in God, that this is a viable option for a thinking man or woman today. By contrast, the opposition has taken on the enormous burden of proof of having to show that everyone who believes in God is literally deluded. Now, have they offered any good arguments to think that that is the case? Well, as I listened to Andrew's speech, I heard only two arguments in favor of God's being a delusion. The first was to provide a sort of history of religions about how people come to believe in gods. Now, if that is meant to be an argument against the existence of God, this is almost a textbook example of the genetic fallacy. What is that? The genetic fallacy is trying to invalidate a person's position or belief by showing how it originated, how he came to believe it. And that's clearly logically fallacious. I may have come to believe that the earth is round by reading it in a comic book. Uh, that would hardly be good justification, but does that mean that belief is therefore false? Well, obviously not. So the first argument is worthless, ladies and gentlemen. It is a literal logical fallacy. What about the second argument he gave? Well, these gods are like us, he said. That is a good argument against polytheism, as I suggested. But this is not a good argument against the traditional concept and belief in God which is the belief in a metaphysically necessary, beginningless, timeless, spaceless, omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect being. There could hardly be something le less like us than that sort of being. So again, uh, the argument simply doesn't hold water. Now, notice those are the only arguments that the opposition has offered tonight for showing that belief in God is a delusion. That's it, and neither one of them is compelling. On the other hand, we have offered arguments in favor of God's existence. First, the moral argument, that if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist, but some objective moral values exist, therefore God exists. And I was astonished to hear the response of the opposition to this. Their view is that there literally are no objective moral values. On their view, on their naturalistic view, moral values are just the products of socio-biological evolution which have been ingrained into us and which we therefore accept, much as a troop of chimpanzees or even elephants which exhibit this sort of social behavior. Yes? Seeing as you uh, you're using animals here. Yes. Our objective moral animal, uh, objective moral values are only uh, related to humans. Can they not also be related to animals? If they're objective, do they not relate to all of existence? And uh, therefore, um, are you are you sort of? Should there be a qualification saying uh, our objective moral moral values in the mind of man, as opposed to therefore God exists in the mind of man, as opposed yeah. to He exists totally? Yeah. Um, m animals are not moral agents. When an, a lion kills a zebra. It kills the zebra, but it doesn't murder the zebra. When a great white shark forcibly copulates with a female, it forcibly copulates with her, but it doesn't rape her. Because, you see, none of these things is obligatory or forbidden. 
And it's the same on naturalism for human beings. These are just ingrained sociobiological patterns of behavior that evolution has put into us. But they're not objectively binding. The rapist who chooses to flout the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably. He's the sort of moral equivalent of Lady Gaga, uh, out of step with the herd. But there really are no objective moral values on this view. Now think of what that means. That means that an atrocity like the Holocaust wasn't really wrong. It was just against the herd morality. But as Darwin himself pointed out, if you rewound the film of human evolution and started anew, a very different type of creature might have uh, uh, emerged with very different set of values. And it would be guilty of speciesism for us to think that our values are objectively binding and true and that other creatures' values are false. So on the naturalistic, atheistic view, there really are no objective moral values. But as Peter explained, you cannot explain uh, things like fallibilism, uh, the self-refuting nature of subjectivism, which says we ought to believe in subjectivism, which is a moral ought about epistemic duties, the proper basicality of our moral beliefs. I'll take the question later. So I think we've got good grounds for believing in objective moral values. And if you agree with me that some things are really right and wrong, like torture, raping a little child, hurting someone for fun, then you should agree with the house that God exists. Now let me go on to the contingency argument. This has not been refuted tonight, that God is the best explanation for why anything exists rather than nothing. And the ontological argument. It might surprise you to know that the majority of philosophers today are agreed that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows necessarily and logically that God exists. What the atheist has to maintain, therefore, is not simply that God doesn't exist. He has to argue that it is impossible that God exists, that the concept of God is incoherent, like a married bachelor or a round square. But as Peter pointed out, the concept of God seems to be a perfectly coherent concept. Finite beings like ourselves exemplify moral goodness, knowledge, and power, and there's nothing about extrapolating these to infinity that would make them incoherent. He also points out that the concept of God is intuitively a coherent idea. And finally, Peter pointed out that the other two arguments we gave also lead to the existence of a metaphysically necessary and good being, so that these, uh, these arguments also suggest that God's existence is at least possible. Referring back to what you were saying previously uh, about the ontological part, yes. all you're essentially doing is, is like Gordon Rose said, you're defining something into existence. You're simply saying, as Kant said, although it needs to bear Mr. Williams' ridicule, is you're describing something like red, blue, round, square, and then you're saying exists is a similar quantity. You're defining existence as a predicate of something. That, that can, existence isn't a predicate. It's not a description of something. It is something that is over and above that object. And by you repeatedly defining something as beyond our conception of everything, mm -hmm. you're referring to the same laborious ontological proof, which says that God is beyond us. We can't conceive of him. Oh, no, no, I think we can conceive of God. That, you've got to at least characterize the argument accurately. And Peter and I agree with you that existence is not a property. But necessary existence is a property. And the idea of a being which is um, omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect in every possible world is an intuitively coherent idea. And so it follows that God's existence is either possible or it's impossible. Take your pick. Now what this means is that the opposition must show that you are literally deluded if you think that God's existence is even possible. If you even think that it's possible that God exists, uh, then according to the opposition, you're deluded. That's all we need to show is that it's possible that God exists, and then it follows that he does. So it seems to me in conclusion that we've got very good arguments for God's existence two of which haven't even been addressed by the opposition. And this leaves us in a rather awkward situation. Arif Ahmed is going to get up in a moment and lay into the contingency argument, the ontological argument, and we won't have a chance to respond because Andrew chose not to do so in his first speech. That's not proper debate etiquette. You're supposed to respond to the affirmatives <laughs> case in the opening speech. So what does Arif need to do in his final speech? <laughs> 
What he needs first to do is to give us some reason to think that belief in God is delusory, that everyone who believes in God is suffering from a delusion. Secondly, he needs to respond to each one of those three arguments that we gave and show why it is delusory to believe in the premises of those arguments. Unless and until he does that, I think that we should stick with the House's resolution that belief in God is not delusory. Now, in conclusion, although Peter and I have argued for God's existence tonight, the question before us this evening really isn't, does God exist? The question is, is belief in God a delusion? And those are two very different questions. You may not believe that God exists, but that doesn't mean you think that everybody who does is therefore suffering from a delusion. You recognize there are many gifted and brilliant thinkers who do believe in God, and it would be presumptuous of you to judge them as deluded. So I think people can disagree with each other respectfully without calling each other deluded. I'll take your point of order. I was speaking with a psychology student the other day who was telling me that when you measure the brain waves of someone who is actually deluded and the brain waves of someone who is fervently religious, they match up to an extraordinary degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not aware of those studies, but clearly you cannot judge the content, the propositional content of a, the, of a belief as to its truth value by brain activity. Brain activity is just electrical activity in the nervous system. It doesn't have propositional content. To determine truth or falsity of propositional content, you need arguments. So we mustn't appeal to brainwave activity to try to invalidate theism. You've got to deal with the arguments. Now, in a few minutes, we're all going to walk through one of two doors to register our opinion on tonight's question. Some of us will walk through the door saying yes, others will walk through the door saying no. Which door you choose makes a profound statement about you personally. <laughs> through the one door, through the one door, we'll walk not only theists of different varieties, Christians, Muslims, Jews, uh, other sorts of theists, but also agnostics. <laughs> Agnostics who think it's an open question whether God exists. And many, if. Yes? Might agnostics walk through the abstention door in the middle? No, because it. No. If the debate topic tonight were does God exist, right through that center door, the agnostic would go. But the question is is God a delusion? And agnostics, because they're open. They don't know whether God exists. They can't say it's a delusion for everyone who believes in God. Agnostics will join the theists in walking through the door marked I. In fact, many, if not most, atheists will walk through the door marked I. They may disagree with their theistic friends about the existence of God, but they're not prepared to judge all of their believing friends as literally deluded. They recognize that the existence of God is a difficult question on which rational opinion can vary. Peter and I haven't indicted our opponents tonight as being deluded. We think they're mistaken, but we, we wouldn't say they're deluded. Why can't they return the favor? People can disagree <laughs> without calling each other names. So by voting with the House, you show yourself to be open-minded tolerant of a diversity of opinion on difficult questions and also respectful of the beliefs of others. By contrast, in voting with the opposition, you in effect declare that all of your believing friends and professors are literally deluded and irrational. So which door are you going to pick? I hope that you're not that judgmental. I hope you're not. <laughs> that cocksure of yourself. I hope that you will join believers in voting with the House this evening and agreeing that whether the belief in God is true or false, 
Those who believe in God are not deluded. The belief in God is not a delusion. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. And now to round off the case for the opposition and the debate as a whole this evening, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Arif Ahmed, who's a lecturer at Logic here at Cambridge University and a vocal proponent of atheism. Arif, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I'm not going to tell agnostics or anyone else how to vote. You've got to make your own mind up about that. But I will start by saying something about Craig's flip-flopping definition of emotion. In response to one point of information concerning the psychological activity of delusional people, he was insistent that the question was whether it was true or false. That was the only issue about whether God exists. Then later on, he made it into an issue about whether belief in God is a delusion, where that's supposed to carry connotations of mental disorder or some form of necessity for treatment, or certainly at least our pity. Um, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not generally in the habit of using arguments from authority, but on this one occasion I will. Um, a noted Christian scholar um, uh, said in a debate with Bill Cook in New Zealand in 2006 that the dictionary defines a delusion as a false belief. And I'm going to take the motion, which in this case was, is God a delusion, to mean, is the belief in God false? Uh, the person was Professor William Lane Craig. <laughs> so I think I'm going to take the, Craig, the dictionary which Craig has in common with the shorter Oxford English Dictionary, which is a false belief. The, point the issue before us tonight is therefore, is it true or false that God exists? <coughs> We've seen three arguments in favour of the belief that God exists. The moral argument, the cosmological argument, and the ontological <coughs> argument. I'll start with the moral argument to which I think Andrew Copson gave perfectly reasonable objections. Copson's objection was principally to premise two of the argument, at least one objective moral value exists. And in response, we've had a lot of huffing and puffing about um, moral disagreement and the ration, you know, what, thinking that it's self-refuting because you ought to believe something and that commits you to there being objective moral values. Well, in fact, that's the only argument that I can, I can recall being given for premise two. That argument confuses saying what you morally ought to do with what you're rationally required or with what it is at least a rational response to the evidence to do. I'm not saying you're naughty or a bad person if you don't draw the conclusions, conclusion from the premises of a valid argument. I'm not saying you ought to do it in that sense. All I'm saying is that you're irrational if you don't. And moreover, if you believe the premises and not the conclusion, you will certainly believe something false. Nothing moral in that, so there's nothing self-refuting in the denial of premise two. There was no other evidence given at all for premise two, um, so it seems to me an open question whether or not it's correct. Simply appealing to your or my deep down knowledge that it's true is again not an argument, it's just an assertion. As for premise one of that argument, if God does not exist and objective moral values do not exist, I've never really seen what the problem is supposed to be here. Look, moral philosophy has been being done for thousands of years by people who have no belief in or interest in the deity. And anyone who's done a course in philosophy will be perfectly aware of this. If the problem is... Well, actually, I'm, I'm just not clear what the problem is, but let me try and sketch one view you might have if you do accept premise two, one view you might have on which you could believe in uh, objective moral values without believing in a deity. So you might say, for instance, that as well as all the material objects in the world, like people and particles and electrons and so on, the world contains as its fabric moral reasons. There are such things as reasons to do this or reasons to do that, and these are moral reasons which are binding upon us. Now, that can be something which is just a brute primitive fact. I see no contradiction in that statement. Or it can be something which you base upon something else. For instance, you might think the moral value of an act depends upon its effects upon other persons or perhaps also other animals and perhaps ultimately on the pain that it causes or the harm of other sorts that it causes to other persons or animals if you think they too are bearers of these rights. Nothing in that account appealed to God. No valid argument can be given from that account 
to the conclusion that God exists. And there seems no reason whatever, as far as I can see, for thinking that we, you, this is a perfectly decent basis for believing in moral values without a deity. And I should emphasise that it's just one of many moral systems which appeal to what are plainly objective facts to ground morality quite independently of God. On that point, yep. the two things you defined, which were consequentialism, I think, and simple objective moral values and fabric of God, consequentialism um, is, 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 is not objective because the, uh, what one does in a given situation there is in the goodness or badness of an act is not contained in the act itself, so uh, killing someone, uh, for example, is not always wrong. And the, um, whilst, the other, whilst the other belief is perfectly rational, um, in the, well, in that it is not self-contradictory. I don't believe it is a good explanation of uh, how moral values came to exist. If we feel the need to explain the physical universe, then we must also feel the need to explain <coughs> the moral universe if such a thing does exist. And therefore, it simply, it, it not being self-refute, self-contradictory, uh, is not enough to show that it is reasonable to me. Thanks for that. Um, on the first point to do the consequentialism, the question is whether it's objective in the sense that it doesn't make any difference what anyone believes. And the effects of an act are those effects, whatever anyone else, be else believes. So it is objective. Um, on the second point, I'm not quite sure what sort of explanation you want. I mean, I will admit that theists can say something that the sort of view I'm envisaging can't. So theists can say that you have some self-interest in being moral because God tells you to and then you'll go to heaven if you behave in moral ways. Okay? So morality combines with prudential interests. Whereas the, some of the views that I have in mind will say that sometimes prudence and so, uh, moral self-interest and moral reasons come apart. It can sometimes, on the views I have in mind, but not on the view the questioner seems to have in mind, it can sometimes really be a good thing to do something that is genuinely not in your interest. So that's one way in which the theist might, that's one kind of morality that the theist might be able to support, but I myself am not an adherent of it. I move on now to the cosmological argument. Uh, this has three premises, premise one, premise two, and premise four. I'm not going to contest premise two, as you might guess, but I will discuss premises one and four. Premise one, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. Well, the first thing I'll say is that uh, uh, Dr. Williams' uh, example of the glass bowl is somewhat naive. Um, there certainly is some doubt in my mind, and more importantly, in the minds of many physicists, as to what the correct <coughs> interpretation of the quantum theory is, but on many interpretations of that theory, things do indeed happen by chance. Now, one example of this is what they call quantum vacuum fluctuations, where particles come into existence uh, by chance, that is, without any external cause. And another example, so I understand, is quantum tunneling, which is a case, which could indeed be a case, where the universe itself came into existence through a random event without any cause at all. Now, I'm not an expert on this, and I wouldn't presume to give anyone in this room a lecture on it, but I will say at least that appealing to fantasies about seeing a glass bowl in a forest is not very good evidence for premise one when quantum theory throws it into doubt. On premise four, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Um, I was losing count of the number of things that were wrong with that. <laughs> With that premise, there are various things of which I shall, I shall mention only a couple. How am I doing for time? You've got 12, oh, seven minutes left. Sorry. Thank you. One issue, of course, is to do with the inference to a mind. The claim that if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God, despite the, the well, we still haven't been given a proper definition of God, but we take it that God is something that requires some sort of mind, mentality, consciousness, or something like that. The argument was almost completely opaque to me, but as far as I could tell, the idea was that because it's something outside of time, and therefore an abstract object, it can't have any causal power unless it's a mind. But of course, I've never seen any minds that exist outside of time, I don't think anybody else has. I don't think there's any evidence at all that there could be such a thing as a mind outside of time. In fact, it's not clear what could possibly be, exist timelessly other than the other example of abstract objects uh, that I think uh, Professor Craig mentioned, uh, which are numbers or other mathematical items. <coughs> 
The second issue concerns the notion of explanation. Um, I mean, there are two ways of thinking about explanation that are familiar to me. One is what they call, call a causal explanation, and the other one is what is called a uh, nomological, deductive nomological explanation. I won't go into the details too much, but I'll just make the essential points here. One way to explain things is to explain how it was caused by something. And causes, it seems, are familiar events that we observe in the world around us, where one event precedes another, and typically events of the first type are followed by events of the second type. That's the sort of basis we have for calling a sequence of events a causal sequence. Now, nothing like that can happen here. Okay? We have a timeless being, supposedly a mind, though I see no reason to call it that, we have a timeless being, which through some mysterious mechanism, which I can't understand how it could possibly be causal, brings about a universe. So not only the supposed explanation, the mind, but also its connection with the universe itself, causation, are both left entirely opaque, and not only opaque, but apparently inconsistent with the timelessness that's required of anything supposedly outside of the universe. Um, as I said, there are various other difficulties that I have with that argument, but time is getting relatively short, so I'll move on now to the ontological argument. I would sum up by saying we've got no reason to believe premise one, and we've got serious reason to disbelieve premise four. The argument, therefore, is not sound. <coughs> Moving on to the ontological argument, um, <laughs> there was much in this that I found confusing, and even more that I found objectionable, um, but I will say just one thing about it. Um, Despite its almost incomprehensible presentation, I did get some idea of the notion of necessity, the idea of necessity that was in play here, and it was something to do with not involving a contradiction or being logically possible or something like that. Okay? But of course, if that's what necessity means, then it's entirely unclear how a necessary being could be even possible. For a being to be necessary means that its existence, its inexistence, by some logical law, entails a contradiction. Okay? <coughs> but I, I teach logic to first-year students of philosophy, and I use a book called Introducing Formal Logic, which I'm pleased to say was written by a colleague of mine. Nowhere in that book is there any logical principle that shows a contradiction in the premise that nothing exists. So no existence at all, it seems on that definition, can exist necessarily. And not only does it not exist necessarily, but there could be no necessary existent by that argument, or at least by that definition, which is the only one we were given, of necessity. It seems, therefore, that we have good reason to doubt premise two, if God is defined as a necessary being. But, of course, we also have reason to doubt the first sentence under number three, which is the basis for premise one, That sentence was that, as the greatest possible being, God is, by definition, a necessary being. Now, greatness is supposed to be something positive, or I got that impression, at least from Williams' response to one of the questioners, when he said, well, stupidity is not a greatness-making property. So greatness-making properties are just not, th not just things that can come in degrees, but they're things that are somehow good or positive in some way. But then I'm at a loss to see why necessity should be a greatness-making property at all. So think about any examples at all. Think about a great man or a great work. So, so think about, for instance, I don't know, Mozart's Requiem is a great piece of music. It was composed almost entirely by accident because the person who commissioned it, his wife, died and he decided to pass somebody else's work off as his own. There was a chain of events which was entirely uh, fortuitous, might well not have happened. The existence of that work is a complete accident. We're very fortunate that it does exist, but it's contingent and not necessary. It's as contingent as anything could be. Now, suppose the musicologist came along and said, silly old Mozart, if only that work had been necessary, it would have been a much better requiem. <laughs> well, I won't, I, I, won't, I won't say anything more about that point, other than to say that, that it illustrates why it is at least entirely unclear why necessity should be any sort of great-making property at all. So to sum up, we've seen reasons to doubt premise two. In fact, we've reasons to seen reasons to deny premise two. We've also seen reason to deny the first sentence under number three, and therefore reasons to doubt premise one. We've seen reasons to doubt premises one and four of the cosmological argument, and we've seen reasons to doubt both premises of the moral argument. None of those arguments therefore remain. I turn now to arguments against God's existence. How much time have I got? One minute. Thank you. 
The first argument actually takes as one of its premises the assumption that God is necessary. Of course, if you don't accept that, then the, argument, then the proposition's argument falls apart anyway. But if you do accept it, then we can simply go back to what I was saying earlier. If God is necessary, and if, as I said, by, by the definition of necessity that we have on the table, no necessary beings exist, then plainly God doesn't exist. Now, that's a very simple argument with two premises and a conclusion. It's valid. We see no reason tonight to doubt either of the premises. The second argument goes back to something that my colleague was saying, uh, which is to do with a multitude of possible hypotheses. None of these arguments tonight, the cosmological argument is perhaps the most, most clear example, support the hypothesis of one god as opposed to many gods, or a powerful god as opposed to, say, to, say a committee of bumblers, for instance. There is no particular reason, therefore, to give any special evidential weight to the hypothesis that God exists, which, as somebody said over there, is indeed in the singular, as opposed to many gods, two gods, three gods, a dozen gods. There is therefore... No, I'm running out of time. There is therefore... <laughs> There is therefore no reason to give any one of those propositions more than infinitesimal probability. I'll wrap up now. Um, when, I start, when, I, when I told a colleague of mine that I was going to enter this debate, he said, well, you don't want to debate with Christians because they're all, they're all mad and, and impervious to reason. And, of course, my being here shows that I deny that. Of course, that's, that's not only false, I think it's, it's, it's plainly false. I myself was brought up in a religious background, it was in an Islamic tradition, not in a Christian tradition, and I can sympathise with some of the motivations that people have for believing in God. It would give me great comfort, actually, to think that I'll see, see again relatives that I've lost, uh, and certainly to think that I'll come back after I've died. <coughs> However, none of that, I think, should stop us from recognising that the arguments that we've seen tonight, and indeed any other arguments that I'm aware of, give us no reason whatever to believe that this is actually true, motivated as it may be by very laudable motives, or at least ones that are shared by me. In my own case, I knew that something was wrong when, in my days of believing, I would seize upon arguments for God's existence with joy if they seemed to be plausible, and not press into them too closely because I was worried they would fall apart. If you're doing that, you know there's something wrong. I'm happy to discuss with any Christians or recovering Christians who would like to talk to me about their doubts concerning God's existence. If you don't want to talk to me or you don't, you don't want to contact other atheists, then I would recommend you at least read something about the subject. The most important book on this subject is Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, um, and that would be an excellent place to start. Finally, I'll say then that, as I said, I'm not going to tell you which door to walk out of. That's a matter for you to decide. But I hope I've made clear exactly what the proposition is, the weakness of the arguments in favour of it. I would finally say to those of you who are Christians but having doubts, however you vote tonight, I don't care so much about winning the motion, but however you vote tonight, if you at least think about it for yourself, and if some of you at least come to start, despite whatever motivations you've had, you come to start to doubt your beliefs in the supernatural entities that we've been discussing tonight, then that would represent, I think, a triumph of intellectual courage over deluded conviction. Thank you. Okay, uh, right, now, for those of you who are new to the union this evening, we're going to vote on the motion, and if you're downstairs, the door by which you leave is significant, uh, nose to the left, eyes to the right, and abstentions through the middle. If you're in the gallery or in one of the overflow rooms, then people will try to take your vote on the stairs, and the results will be announced in the bar in a few minutes' time. Can you, all can you join me, though, in giving a really warm round of applause and thanks to all our speakers this evening.
nine. Oh. Abstentions, 129. The motion passes with 14 votes. Oh.